As a boy, Mars was some far-off place scientists said we'd one day send explorers. Educational posters with concept artist renderings were the only way to imagine a society advanced enough to achieve such science fiction. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, it seemed the dream of space was fading. We hadn't been to the moon since before I was born. Momentous projects like Skylab and Mir gradually deteriorated and fell out of the sky. And as for Mars... The Red Planet had bested more unmanned probes than we'd been able to send successfully to our next neighbor in space. The future was not what we'd hoped. Then one day I read about America's newest manned deep space craft. Not some exotic space plane or hypothetical interstellar ship, This Orion looked like a throwback to the Apollo era. Okay, that's nice, I thought. We're regressing back to the Stone Age of human spaceflight, not advancing. Probably just a funding gimmick anyway, what with every movie a remake and every sports car a classic reboot nowadays. Then again, that new Challenger is pretty cool. Orion, it turns out, was more intriguing than I'd expected. Larger than Apollo, for one. More crew capacity and built to visit a nearby asteroid, or what was this? Mars? Surely a working manned Mars ship would never fly. America didn't aspire to such heights anymore. Besides, how would we even launch something like a mission to Mars? Enter the SLS. The first time I saw a sketch of the planned space launch system, my jaw dropped a bit and I felt a little nostalgia for those artist concepts from my youth. This thing would be incredible, dwarfing anything I'd ever seen, reminiscent of the old Saturn V's that took us to the moon so long ago, plus with modern lifting power that set this new spaceship design squarely in my time. When NASA's social media team invited me to be a part of Orion's Exploration Flight Test 1, I knew I had to be there. America's fabled journey to Mars was literally getting off the ground. Texas has always been a part of the space program. Mission Control at Johnson Space Center, just south of Houston, has been on duty since the beginning of manned spaceflight, through the illustrious shuttle era, and continuing on for the ISS. With credentialed access to the facility for what could be history in the making, my childhood fascination with deep space and the science of its exploration had been rekindled. This event would be my opportunity to live the dream of being a part of NASA for the day, and my chance to tell people about this newly discovered world of innovation happening right under our noses in what might have been mistakenly considered the detritus of an age gone by. We started our day at Rocket Park inside JSC. These simple grounds house monuments to our victories in the space race, from a mighty Saturn V laid out on end, to the once again relevant Little Joe II, the proving rocket in the 60s for the Apollo program's capsules and launch abort system, the progeny of which would soon be facing trial by fire, but now atop a modern Delta IV Heavy. Our media handlers arrived in personnel buses to get the group badged and on the way for a fast-paced day of getting caught up on America's ongoing human spaceflight programs. The first stop was at JSC's renowned Neutral Buoyancy Lab, otherwise known as the Big Pool. Standing next to a full-scale splashdown mock-up of the Orion capsule, the NBL's director explained that dive training operations at the more than 6 million gallon pool are the most dangerous thing that is done at Johnson Space Center. We were given up-close access to the water's edge. It has a length of over 200 feet and is more than 100 feet wide. The pool deck itself stands 20 feet above the ground floor, but the bottom is another 20 feet below that, excavated to the limits of the local coastal geography. We were warned to avoid the water's edge, a risk being one of many to have been drawn in by its illusory gravitational effect. With a boom pole in hand, I couldn't help but hazard a video glance at the astronaut training modules below. The neutral buoyancy lab is big enough to conduct dual simultaneous training operations for missions such as ISS module repairs and even Orion EVAs. No longer needed for shuttle training, the NBL's operating budget has been cut in half, so the facility also hosts private energy firms for leased EVAC training exercises. The supplemental income is federally mandated not to exceed competitive rates, but there truly is nothing that can compete with this world-class facility. 
After a photo at the NBL, our group got an inside look at the actual Apollo Mission Control Room. The vintage consoles and accoutrements are actually preserved as a National Historic Site, and with projected footage of lunar missions silently playing over the now dark CRTs, it was hard not to wonder how we'd ever accomplished so much with so little. It should be easy by today's standards to navigate to a passing comet or routinely fly to the nearby moon, but without the feverish spending that came with the Cold War, shoestring budgets have relegated NASA's formidable innovative capacity to solving not the questions of how, but of how much. That's not to say things haven't improved in 50 years. Following the time in Apollo mission control, we were treated to a quiet look at the actual operators and environment that is mission control for the International Space Station. Digital consoles and high-definition downlinks complement the modern collaborative space. We could rest assured that the new system was far more capable to oversee our continuing orbital expeditions. After a brief moment to observe the business at hand, it was off for a special tour, a look inside one of the brand new Orion program MCCs. Now, this was a setup to be proud of. Simple lines and modern furniture composed the modular ergonomic workstations that our next generation would utilize for untold mission configurations. Touch screens, state-of-the-art networking, optimized for efficiency, this is where we were headed. We had a quick lunch and learned about how meal planning was being investigated for tomorrow's deep space astronaut. Food being psychologically necessary for long-term sustainability of the human system, protein pills will not suffice. It's also not as simple as throwing a bunch of MREs or freeze-dried food in the Orion service module for a two-year trip to Mars. The meals routinely supplied to the space station have shelf lives of about six months, but nutritional content breaks down even faster than that. So the dietetic scientists at NASA are always on the hunt for ways to produce long-lasting foodstuffs or renewable sustenance for the journeys ahead. At midday, we joined the other NASA facilities around the country for a video conference event. Broadcast live on NASA TV, I was given the opportunity to speak with the spokesperson for NASA's commercial crew program. He highlighted the vitality of a burgeoning private space industry. From companies either asteroid mining, uh, putting up their own private space stations, satellite servicing, the moon has a lot of opportunities. We've got the Google um, Lunar X Prize and things like that. There's so many potential ideas. Uh, again, we're only limited by our imagination and of course, a good business plan. NASA plans to encourage and leverage commercial crew to support our continuing orbital needs more economically. He also said it's important to remember that funding that goes to space is still spent on Earth, going towards jobs and growth that is valuable to us now, while being beneficial to the entire human race for the future. After the social press briefing, the fun continued with a visit inside the systems engineering sim lab, where designers try out future control architectures on open source software connected to immersive user interface demonstrators. An Orion pilot's console is mocked up in a darkened projector room, creating a virtual ISS docking scenario for finalizing the new capsule's hardware and software. Eager to get in the cockpit, I was given, and admittedly nerfed, chance to catch the ISS docking port in a simulated orbit proud to say I nailed it right on the crosshairs. Never enough time for video games, but we next were given a quick chance to speak with astronaut maker Lee Morin in his Orion Controls Rapid Prototyping Lab, a simple conference room converted into a half-capsule mock-up. This is where engineers and astronauts collaborate to build the perfect controls for tomorrow's manned craft. With the power of 3D printing, Moran and his colleagues are able to churn out designs quickly and cheaply and test them practically and exhaustingly to perfect the hands-on responsiveness on which Orion crews will one day rely. One of their latest innovations is a mouse-like grip control that will allow astronauts to confidently manipulate flight and information systems while wearing bulky pressure suit gloves on a shaky rocket ride. The Orion is expected to utilize large, multifunctional displays instead of the switch panels and analog gauges of yore. To make sure all of that complexity works as advertised, the redundant, resilient control afforded by this homebrew design will likely be essential. Finally, we ended at NASA's Vehicle Design Mock-Up Facility, a veritable playground of space vehicles and station modules that support personnel and crew used to make sure everything is correct while there's still time to change it. Dr. Camille Ayin spoke with us inside the full-sized ISS module about the tangible value of the science that continues above on the real McCoy. 
They're doing important health research into the mystery that although the human immune system tends to be somewhat suppressed in prolonged free fall, astronauts don't get sick on station. And that's particularly interesting because there's no shortage of germs on the surfaces of the showerless, multinational facility. She also reiterated that one of the primary goals of ISS now is to help commercialize low Earth orbit. As NASA TV recently put it, NASA needs to fully focus on the mission of exploring deep space now, but we're still not ready to give up on all of the valuable science that's coming out of LEO. Another treat is astronaut Doug Wheelock met us to tour the Russian Soyuz. Astro Wheels experienced the cramped Soyuz ride before and after his six-month expedition to the ISS. He recounted having to be stuffed into the capsule by Russian boot for an uncomfortably intimate trip shared among three men at a time. Any service in space requires surrendering the creature comforts of Earth for a long time. So much so that Wheelock even recalls smelling candy when the Soyuz hatch was at last opened on the steps of Russia. His veteran cosmonaut colleague had to convince him that the sweet smell was actually Mother Earth, a large mound of which had been plowed by the returning capsule. In space, even tastes and smells are muted as human taste buds are less effective in zero-g. Add to that a several-month reacclimation period for learning to judge closing speeds and relativity all over again, and it's easy to concede that these men and women may not have the most fun job to look forward to every day. Just most days. At last we came to the main event, an actual reference model of the brand new Orion capsule. Compared to the Soyuz, this thing is a yacht, but it still took a little finesse to swing into the commander's seat. Looking around the prototype model, I had to appreciate for a moment that if my sons were to sign up for this life one day and fly to Mars for all mankind, they might very well be sitting in this type of capsule to do it. It was a little reverential to be sitting inside a piece of history in the making, which is what Orion is today. The future is actually beginning to come together at long last. We've got a plan to start making those artist renderings a reality. We're putting that plan into motion. There have been setbacks, and there may well be several more along the way. But for the first time that I can recall, we are moving forward. And lift off at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. 